the third part from the first session, starting now, general class upgrade from W5HRC, the Hearst Amateur Radio Club, coming up. Shut up and sit down. Mars code, CW for continuous wave. You don't need to know Mars code anymore to have a ham radio license. Although, it's not going out of style. Any of you get QST Magazine, the ARRL? QST Magazine has contests, what they call Contest Corral. And they have a listing in there of all the contests that are going on, these operating contests. Where you can go in and participate and win awards and all this kind of stuff or just have fun. You know, the Illinois QSO party, uh, any number of things. You go look at that contest corral and you find out what modes they're using. At least half of those contests are using CW. Still in use, still popular, although you don't have to know how to use it anymore. I don't use, I, I, got, I got my extra class license when I had to know 20 word per minute code. Took me 15 years of effort to get to the point where I got my code speed up high enough to do 20 word per minute code. I took the code test, I thought this is great, I walked out and didn't feel any better about myself than when I went in, other than I just accomplished something. <coughs> but I don't use C CW very much um, because I don't like the sound of it. That was what was so hard for me to learn. I'd learn it, I'd be studying, I thought one day I'm gonna put, I had a cassette, you try how old it was. I had a cassette and I put in a cassette player in the car and it had CW, practice on it. I'm just gonna ride home, I'm not gonna try it, concentrate on it, I'm just gonna let it play in the background, kind of try to subliminally absorb that. My, let my subconscious ab absorb that. That guy cut me off. Well, I'll run him off the road, look at that idiot! And I realized, it was enraging me. I realized my problem was, while well, not learning code, I didn't like the sound of it. Uh, any, any musician who I offend, I, 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 I'm going to apologize. For me, CW is like bagpipe music. It's music for about the first minute, and after that it becomes noise. Okay, that's the way I, that's my perception. But anyhow, CW is great. I encourage people to use it. I try to keep my code speed up to at least five to six words a minute by practicing occasionally, just so I don't lose it. But it's not something I enjoy. I like how you voice off an old phonograph record in the Milwaukee County Library. Uh-huh. Yeah, we do practice here on Saturday mornings. Some Saturday mornings. <laughs> you need to talk with... What we're not doing anymore is uh, well, the guy that yeah, Saturday. yeah. But check check with us and make sure we're doing it. But we've done it from time to time. Yeah, it we it kind of we do it for a while and everybody gets up to where they want to get and then we kind of slack off and then we some more people want it we set it, start it up again and do it again. So I usually come in. It starts at eight thirty. I usually come in at nine. <laughs> so anyhow. That's the original digital mode. It's the original mode before voice, before anything else. When ham radio started, before it was even ham amateur radio, when it was just radio, when it was just wireless, as they call it, it's the original, that's how they communicate. It's, origi it's the original digital mode. It's either on or off. It's like a digital signal. It's either a signal or an absence of a signal. It has extremely narrow bandwidth because the only information is the signal being turned off and on. You're not superimposing anything else on it. It's just off and on. During noisy conditions, CW can often get through and most other modes cannot. I'm going to qualify that. Okay. Um, CW, in the past, uh, up to just a few years ago, you could be a, there could be a voice signal. You could listen on the voice when, the, when propagation was bad, when conditions were bad. You could listen through the voice segments of the ham radio band and have a hard, if you did hear somebody, you had a hard time making them out and you tune down to the CW portion and you could hear that Morse code nice and plain. It could, used to be able to get through because it uses a narrow bit, a narrow, a little, a little, just a little bit of bandwidth. Also, I don't listen to a wide bandwidth. When I narrow down the bandwidth of my receiver to compensate for it, I also narrow down all that noise that's all surrounding it. So it, it gets through. Now, there are new computerized digital modes that will decode digital data when you can't hear it. One of the modes is PSK31, one of them I use is a conversational mode, it's a slow speed mode, we'll talk about it later. I turn my radio on, I listen to that warbly little signal. I've decoded with about 
85 to 90 percent accuracy. I've decoded C, uh, PSK 31 signal conversations without ever being able to hear it at all. So it does beat out CW now. CW no longer is the king that he can get through when nothing else can, but here's the real kicker. It doesn't require any special equipment other than this. Your ability to hear it and your ability to process it, it doesn't require any computers. You can get on the air on 80 meters, on 40 meters. You can get on the air on the general class band for less than $10 for the transceiver that does CW only. There's, there's, now they call them, Pic, Pixie is one of the popular ones. It's a very primitive transceiver, CW transceiver. And that and a piece of wire for an antenna and a code key and a battery can get you on the air and uh, probably total 15 bucks for the whole thing. Now, so you can still use CW. The only equipment that, that, that it requires is you be able to hear it and process the code. That's the advantage it has. So it still is king when it comes to getting through when most everything else can't without a computer. Okay. That may be a good reason to know CW, because it doesn't, and your repeaters identify, a lot of repeaters identify with CW. Here's the guidelines if you're going to operate CW. And I encourage you, that if you think you would like to do CW, I encourage you to do it. Even though I don't, like I say, I'm not, I find that I, it aggravates me, but I encourage you to use CW. A lot of people love it, they live by it. I try to keep my speed up, I wish I did too, but I encourage you, for something you like, go for it. If you're going to do it, match the speed. Speed is very, very critical. There's a speed in which you're comfortable in receiving a signal. You're comfort, comfortable in decoding that signal in your mind. If you're listening, someone calls CQ and you answer them, if they're sending to you at seven words a minute and you can send 25 words a minute, answer them at seven. Don't send and don't send faster than you can receive. Now, you got somebody sending at seven or ten words a minute. You can only answer them at 20. Then guy couldn't come back to me. Since CQ again. I answer him again, 20. He didn't come back to you. You answer him again. He, he don't want to talk to you. He wants to talk to somebody at what he can understand, what he's comfortable with. He didn't want to strain. It's supposed to be fun for him. So answer at the same speed if you're answering somebody. And don't send faster than you can receive. Here's the advantage. When you s listen to a CW signal, you hear, the, you hear the, the, the signal, and your mind processes it, and says, okay, this is what the character is. You either write it down or remember it in your head. Either way, there's a processing time. Okay. And you don't necessarily know what the next one's going to be. So it's a new processing loop every time. When you're going to send it, you already know what you're going to say. You've got to jump on it. So typically, you can send faster than you receive. Don't do that. Because somebody's going to send back to you. If you send faster than you receive, they're going to answer you at faster than you receive. Maintain 150 to 500 hertz spacing from from other stations, match the frequency. Send on the same frequency, it's called zero beating. Send your, set your radio to you hear that nice, pure CW signal, and that's the one you transmit on. Don't transmit off frequency one way or the other, because that guy's gonna start chasing you up and down the band. Zero beat to the other station frequency whenever possible. Just, you, you got the opportunity of doing it now. Good old day stuff, when I first started as a novice, I had a separate transmitter, I had a separate receiver, and I was limited to crystal control. Whatever I had crystals for was the frequencies I could operate on. And I had two, three, four crystals. And I'd, that's the only frequencies I could transmit on. So if I sent a CQ, I'd send CQ and I'd listen on my frequency. I didn't hear anybody. Then I'd send CQ and I'd go off and listen on a different frequency because the other guy probably had different crystals. So we'd be operating on one frequency and, and, and receiving on another. Nowadays, you don't need to do that. So. You got a variable frequency oscillator, zero beat, sent on the same frequency that the other person's on. Common signals. This is shorthand. Why do we do this? Okay. Um, QSL. Let's start with that one. That acknowledges receipt. I acknowledge receipt. That means yeah, got it. Roger, ten four. That's what it means. I acknowledge receipt. Why would I want to use QSL? Well, I want to use QSL because I send the letter Q, I send the letter S, I send the letter L, and the other guy knows what I mean. Or I could send W, H, or I could send, 
I R E C E I V E Y O U. Do I want to send all those letters? I just want to send QSL. It's a shorthand. The nice thing about it, too, is that if you're talking with foreign stations and English is not their primary language, they understand all this. They understand QSL, QRL, QRP. They understand all this shorthand. You can communicate back and forth with people who don't even speak English and have a perfectly good conversation. QTH, it's not out here. QTH, that means where are you at? QTH, Croatia. This guy doesn't know any English at all. But he tells me he's located in Croatia, and I know that. And I put QTH, Texas. Well, QSL, acknowledge receipt. QRL, that means frequencies in use. Is it a well, question mark after it makes it a question? Without a question mark, it's a statement. If somebody, all of a sudden, I'm talking to someone else and I hear another signal on top of me, I'll send QRL. That means this frequency is in use. If I want to know if that frequency is in use, I send QRL question mark. QRP, that's lower power. QRS, I used that a lot when I first got my, my novice license. <laughs> a lot. My first contact, I must have sent that five times. Yeah. Please send slower. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, I don't think so. yeah, a lot of a lot of them are, are. There, there's specific. There's a group of whole. There's hundreds, a hundred or so of these things, but we only need to know a few of them. The R's are kind of a standard. The, the, the letter on the end is real. S kind of means slower. Well, I didn't know if the R's were certain kinds of statements or something, and the S's were certain kinds of things, or did they, 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 the they, they, they are. Alphabet? They're they're grouped for different stuff. Some is for message handling. They'll have a different letter here. They group these kind of in logical groups, like a Q R or. A, our uh, QS and things like that. So this is, uh, for example, P, power. Think about P for power, S for slower. N for noise. QRS is send slower, QRV means I'm ready to receive. I may have told the guy stand by for a minute. And uh, then I'm ready to receive, I'll go QRV. QRN means I'm troubled by static, or question mark, are you troubled by static? N, there's two of them, but N means by static. That's natural noise. So you might want to use N for natural noise. I'm troubled, I'm troubled by static. Other things called pro signs. These are more operational. AR means I finish my um, message. Uh, at the end of, uh, end of my message, I'll usually close with AR. That way the guy knows he's ready to send now and I'm finished. CL means I'm closing my station. I'm shutting down completely. DX, that's abbreviation for long distance. SK also means closing station. A silent key. KN, listening for specific stations. Um, let's say I'm sending CQ. I'm sending CQ, 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 and it means I'm willing to talk to anybody, right? CQ means when I send CQ, that means I'm willing to talk to anybody. Maybe I'm not. How about if I send CQ, CQ, KN, DX? What does that mean? I'm willing to talk to anybody, but I'm only going to listen for stations that are long distance, that are international stations. That's a lot easier than spelling all that stuff out. Rather than spelling out, I'm willing to talk to anybody, but I only want to talk to DX stations, the long distance stations. Those are common pro signs. The AR and the KN are the ones you probably see on the question. <coughs> signal reporting. How do you tell somebody else what their signal's like? Well, there's a standard system called the RST system. RST means readability, signal strength, and tone. That was developed for Morse code for CW stations. It's the R, you send a value from one to five. One's not good, five is, a, is great. Like rated from one to five or one to 10, one to nine as we're doing here, the higher the number, the better it is. 
So if I send a readability signal and someone want, I'm telling them how their signal is on my end, depending on how well I can read that signal, how readable it is, whether it's got warble in it or whether it's got uh, a lot of static or stuff in it, I'll give it a rating of 1 to 5. If it's perfectly clear, I'm going to say it's a 5. If it's five, barely under read it, I'm going to tell them it's a 1. How strong is that signal? How much does it make my S meter go up? 1 to 9. Hmm. Nine's the top of my S meter too, isn't it? before I go into dBs over. Okay. Signal strength, one to nine. Perfectly strong. Well, five, nine is a perfectly readable signal, it's extremely strong. T is for tone. What does that Morse code signal sound like? Is it a pure, if I've gotten a nine, is it a pure musical tone? Does it sound really perfect? Does it sound really nice to listen to? Or is it a one, it sounds like an old doorbell buzzer? You know, any place in between there. So if I give someone a, a signal report, if I give them a 599, they're great. They're a perfect signal. After the T, if I, end, if I put a chi, C after it, it means the signal is chirpy. Chirpy is when the voltage on your trans, when, you're, when you key your transmitter down, the voltage kind of fluctuates, and it kind of gives it a, a bird-like sound. Even though it's a really nice tone, it may kind of make it sound like a bird. It's called chirp. And it's, so if it's kind of chirpy, it kind of varies up and down like a parakeet. So see after that. Most times you never see that. You just see 599, one, three, 359, whatever. It's a chirpy signal. You could also use this. Now that's for Morse code. You can also use it for voice. What you do is you don't do tone. You forget about that. It's just RS. What's my signal sound like? 59. A lot of contests, we talked about doing contests where you compete. A lot of them require you to send a signal report. They're going to send you a 5-9, no matter what your signal sounds like. You'll hear them do that. What's my signal? Oh, you're 5-9 in uh, Connecticut. OK, well, you're 5-9 in Texas. Say again. I said you're 5-9 in Texas. Uh, where was that again? Well, I wasn't 5-9. <laughs> but it's easy. You just get everybody a 5-9, you go on to the next one, because you want to make as many contacts as possible. Anyhow, RES is used for signal strength for voice signals. And it's subjective. It depends on the, the ear of the, of the listener. Digital operating. We're going to talk about digital. A digital mode interface. A digital mode interface is that piece that connects your computer with your transceiver. It's a digital mode interface. The one I'm showing here is a USB interface called a signal link. It's pretty popular. It actually uses a sound, the sound, it has a sound card built into it, and it plugs into the computer, it gets information from the computer, and it goes into the back of the radio, usually through a DIN connector. The DIN connector is an audio connector. It's a USB interface between the computer and the transceiver. It permits you to use a lot of different type of signals. Once you've got one of these USB interfaces, or a, a, a sound card interface, as they want to call it, you can run all sorts of different software on your computer, and you can do digital modes, you can do slow scan TV, you can do a whole bunch of stuff just by altering the computer program that you're running. It's pretty cool. You can use do PSK31, other digital modes like MSK, MFSK16, MFSK means multiple frequency shift keying, FT8, that's a new popular one, FT8, that's one of them that you can communicate with other users that you can't even hear. It's kind of cool. You have to wait, wait for them to pop up on your screen before you can communicate with them. All this digital stuff, the nice stuff about digital is it's good for weak signal performance. Weak signal is means when the noise, your, the, your signal is not much above the background noise. PSK31 is one we're going to talk about. Uh, you can use that USB. PSK31 is called PSK31 because it, PSK means phased shift keying. And PSK31, 31, 31 is a transmitter signal rate. It transmits 31 characters per second. It's slow speed. But being slow speed, it doesn't use a lot of bandwidth. It's a keyboard to keyboard, conversational mode. You talk in it. It's like, kind of like an instant email. You talk in it. You know, as, I, as I type on my computer, my keyboard, the guy on the other end is seeing those characters come up on his display as I type them. It uses this thing called very, yeah? Is that going through the internet or is it through no, the air? No, through the air. Okay. Through the air. 
That's one of the signals that I got about 85%, 90% copy on when I couldn't hear the signal. I could see it, I'm, I'm going to show you a waterfall, but I could see the signal on my display, but I couldn't hear it. It uses a varicode. Varicode is like Morse code. Those of you who know Morse code, the way Morse code is set up, the most frequently used letters are the shortest code. E is a dot, a dip. T is a dash. M is two dashes. A is a dot and a dash. As you, the more, less frequently used letters are longer. They've got three characters or four characters in them. So the very, it's called, and this is the same way. The most frequently used letters is represented by the fewest bits. The more, less commonly used letters is, is uh, you, it takes more bits, just like Morse code does. So it varies, it's called varicode. It varies depending on the letter you send. Don't use upper, don't send everything uppercase because it uses more bits than anything. It, it, uppercase is just nothing but, it's slow. It uses a simple sound card to computer interface. That computer interface could be as cheap as $30 to connect between your computer, free software, to your computer and your, your radio. But there's no error correction. If static bothers, gets in a static, there's a static crash and wipes out that piece of signal, you just don't get, you get garbage. You get a piece of garbage. You may get some real nice text and all of a sudden you'll get an at sign and some blanks and you know, exclamation point and then you'll get some more good letters. So there's no error correction in that. But it's, it's usually pretty good that you can pretty much make out what's being said nevertheless. The phase shift keying, the digital controls, the signal changes, it frequent, it sh shifts the, the phase of the signal back and forth. It's narrow bandwidth. Here's the key on bandwidth. The higher your symbol rate, the more pieces of data that you send, the wider the bandwidth becomes. The more frequency bandwidth it uses. The lower the symbol rate, the narrower that bandwidth is. So if you're sending characters at 31 characters a second, that's pretty narrow. If I'm sending a couple hundred, I'm using a lot more bandwidth. The symbol rate affects the bandwidth, the width of the signal how fast the signal is going through. That's why we're going to talk a little later in the HF band. Because space is at a premium, we use low, narrow bandwidth signals. As you go up in the VHF and UHF, since we've got a lot of real estate up there, we'll use higher, band, higher rate signals, which eat up more bandwidth. Here's PSK, here's a waterfall. When I'm running the software, I get to see signals. My computer, even though I'm tuned to one frequency on my, ra on my radio, my computer is going to look at a whole lot of frequencies. I'm looking at from below 14.071 to above 14.072, and I see all those little narrow signals in there. Now, my, this shows my frequency. This shows total width of the frequency I'm looking at here, from lower frequency to higher frequency. And it scrolls down by time. So this thing falls down like a waterfall. And each one of these things I'm looking at is a signal. I may not be able to hear that signal, but if I put my mouse over that signal and click on it, it'll show up, it'll decode it and show it up on my screen. And I can talk on that channel. We'll look at some of these signals. We talked about overmodulation. This is what a good PSK31 signal looks like. It looks like a railroad track or a ladder. It's pretty well defined. It looks like a railroad track. And the density, the intensity, determines how, how, how strong the signal is. These two signals is a little stronger than that signal. And there are some weak signals there that I can barely, but I may be able to still get 80% out of that one if I click on it. This is what happens when you set your gain too high. Since this is audio going into your, to your um, radio from your computer, if I crank my audio up too high, instead of getting this and that width right there, I get all that splatter on the outside. I can't even decode that signal. If I click on that, it's going to give me garbage because it's got so much noise in it. It's also going to interfere. I've seen signals that on this, on this type of band, sorry, I've seen signals that wide on field day. Bedford Amateur Radio Club. We were operating on field day two, three years ago about here at Hearst. They said, what is that? Well, I managed to, we managed to finally pick a signal out of it, and I realized who it was. They weren't very far away. They had the power turned up. I mean, you, you could use low power on this stuff. 
you could use four or five watts. They had it cranked up to, to um, uh, 100, about 100 watts. They had the mic gain set up all the way, and it was, it was taken up, wiping out most of the band. I was able to get on the, the HT, and I knew who was, on, who was operating, and I called him, and I said, you got to turn things down a little bit, guy. Oh, okay. So he turned it down, and it worked just fine. But he, the thing about it is, is that you're seeing on this waterfall display, you're seeing other people's signals. You don't see your own. Had he been able to see his own on that display, he would never, he would, he would fix that right away. So I can't fault him for it. You know, he just figured, I'm going I'm to get out. I'm going to crank my power up. I'm going to crank my audio up. And uh, he wiped the band up. So this is, a, this is a waterfall display. You can see the fact of strong signals. You can see overdriven signals. You can see what weak signals look like. That's the nice thing about these digital modes. These digital modes allow you to, on your computer, and the, and the software is free, allows you to see these signals and pick out which one you want to operate on. You don't even have to listen. You just, ah, that sounds like a good one. I'll click on it and see what he says. FT8. This is the newest, one of the newest, most popular ones. It's a bit different. FT8 is a digital mode that handles very weak signals very well. When you think the bands are dead, FT8, people are still using FT8 talking back and forth. It uses an eight tone frequency shift keying. It's fairly easy to set up. And it works very well even with low signal to noise ratio. You know what signal to noise ratio is? That means the ratio beside, b between how loud the background noise is and how loud your signal noise is. A good signal to noise ratio is when your signal that you are interested in is considerably louder than the background noise. A low signal to noise ratio means that the signal that you are interested in is about the same amplitude as the noise. So it's bare, as you call it, buried in the noise. The signal is buried in the noise. It works very well, even when the signal is buried in the noise. It's popular. It's become very popular very quick, and there's a lot of activity. I look on some of the spotter networks to see what bands are open. I go on there, and I see 20, I see six meters. I think six meters is great. It's full of signals. And I turn off everything except voice, and there's nothing there. I turn back on digital, and it's, it's, it's FT8 signals. Same thing on 20 meters. 20 meters, I, I, 20 meters look great. I can turn, turn my radio on, don't hear a thing. It's all FT8 signals. They're, all, they're operating in low noise. It's semi-automatic, semi-automated. It's not a conversational mode. You don't pass in from, you pass very limited information back and forth. It's limited to call sign, grid locator, and signal report. That's what you get. And it's a very small piece of signal, small format, but it's, it's semi-automated. You just say, hey, I want to talk to that guy. You press the button, you talk to him. FT8 digital mode ha handles it very well. Each message is made up of 13 characters. It takes 13 seconds to send. There are four slots per minute, 15 seconds apiece. Okay. You transmit for one 15-second block, then listen to replies for another 15-second block, and transmit again for 15 seconds. That one second on either end is kind of a buffer to allow you to start and stop your signals. Because of that, it requires your computer clock to be accurate within a second. So typically, you're going to have to have some, if you're going to use this, you're going to need some sort of internet-based um, routine that will keep adjusting your, your computer clock to the correct time. This is what, now you remember the waterfall signals that we saw for uh, PSK31, those long strings of signals? This is the same thing, but it's FT8. Look at all these that are crammed in that band and that piece of spectrum. But look, they're just little pieces because they're only 13 or 15 seconds a piece with 13 seconds of transmission. Look at, look at how many are crammed in that band. It's probably really bad uh, propagation, really bad signal conditions, but it's still getting through. Pardon? What is the red? Intensity. Oh. Yeah. Intensity of the signal. Each of these displays work a little bit different. Some change color for its intensities. Others increase the brightness or decrease the brightness. Radio teletype. Been around for a long time. This is one of the early, early digital modes. 
It uses five data bits with additional start and stop bit. It uses a 170 hertz frequency shift. The frequency just wobbles back and forth between 170, one direction that means uh, a one, the other direction means a zero, or an on or an off. It normally uses lower sideband. It's one of the original, old time, digital uh, signals. Radio teletype. And think about this for a second, teletype. It's one that was even used on telephone lines, on landlines. It's how news organizations used to pass information back and forth to one another. It's how corp corporations used to, like ITT, used to communicate with their divisions around the world with radio teletype. And we can also use it on the amateur radio band. Many of you have ever seen a radio teletype, what they used to do is they didn't type that information on the fly. They typed that information in a perforated tape. Yeah. They'd prepare the message, they'd type it out, this tape would run through, okay, they'd probably, and then they'd take their tape and they'd stick it in and they'd run the whole thing. That way they could take their time and type it out, they could make corrections to errors and things like that. Well, it kind of looks like that, that's how it looked, that's kind of representation. And it's going to be either the even or odd parity. There's always, it's always going to be an even number of dots, or holes, or always going to be an odd number of holes. And they add a bit on there to make that parity different. But it's called a Boudot code. It's a five data bit. You use five bits of data to represent every alphabet and number that they want to use. That's called radio teletype. But that's, this is an old one. But it's still used for ham radio, and a lot of people love it. But it takes a special processor. It takes what's known as a terminal node control, controller. The processing, converting this information, takes place inside this TNC, not inside the computer. The computer is used just as a display. It takes what's called a terminal node controller. We use that also for packet radio, <coughs> where it does the processing inside that terminal node, con node controller. AMTOR. AMTOR is an amateur teleprinting over radio. It's a digital mode similar to radio teletype, but it has the ability to check for data errors. Only thing that the, with the BODOT code that you can do is you can tell whether you have a good, inf good data or bad data. If the parity's not right, if you only receive three data bits and it's supposed to be an even parity and you're supposed to have at least four or an even number of data bits, it's just going to blow it off and say it's not a good, good, good character, not do anything about it. Digital mode, AMTOR, it uses much the same format, but it has what's called an ARQ mode, an automatic repeat request mode. And what it does is that along with the sig each signal, it has additional information and that, that applies to the data, and it, the TNC will send what's called an ACK, which is an acknowledge. If, they think, if it thinks it has a correct piece of information that's been unaltered, undamaged, it'll say, okay, that's good, send me more. If it has a NACK, which means a not acknowledge, once happens, it gets it looks at that information and says, this is damaged information, this is not intelligible. It sends a NAC code back, and the original station will retransmit it again. The original station won't retransmit until it retransmits any more until it receives an ACK code. As long as it receives an ACK, it transmits more. NAC, it says, nope, it transmits again. So it just keeps trying until either it gets a good ACK, an ACK code, it acknowledges the data as being good, or it times out. There may be a setting in there that says, after five times, forget it. Okay. That's AMTOR. The packet radio. Packet radio is the original text message. Packet radio looks just like a text message. It, perf it, it performs just like a text message. And actually, that's what you got when you do a text message. You're getting packets. You're getting packets of information. Have you ever noticed if you send somebody a long text message, it breaks it up into three or four little messages? If you send them a short one, it doesn't. What it does is it takes what you typed on your keyboard, it takes that information, and it formats it. It breaks it up and says, okay, I'm only going to send this much at a time. It puts some information on the front. Now, I'm talking, I'm talking both your cell phone and I'm talking packet radio. It puts information on the front. This is a header. It's called routing and handling information. It tells who it goes to, where the header says, where am I sending this stuff to? And how, do, which path do I want it to follow to get there? Okay, that's the first thing that sends on that packet of information, it builds that packet. Then it sends the actual information, it's called a payload. That's the actual data to be sent. The text that you're sending is in that payload. The header is overhead. 
tells us how to get to the earth, how to get to you, and where to go to get there. And on the end, there's a thing called a check. It looks at all of this information before it sends it, and it ticks, ticks the, ticks, it has an algorithm that says, okay, I got so much information here, and so much kind of information here, and so many texts, and I'm going to assign different um, values to the text letter, and I build a thing called a check sum, or check information. I send check data. The check data is related to the format of that signal. And it sends that information out, because it uses a, a pre-established formula to do that. This TNC knows that routine, it knows that algorithm, and knows how to build that check. On the other end, there's going to be another TNC, another terminal node controller, and it's going to know the same thing. It's going to receive that signal, and once it gets that data, it's going to look at that check and say, okay, based on what I have, this is good information, nothing's missing. I do the same, I do the same computation, I come up with the same check number. Good signal, no problem at all. And it accepts that signal. And it goes back and says, get some more? Send me some more. If it doesn't pass the check, it says, whoa, time out. Send it again. And it sends it again. And it keeps sending it until the receiving station says, good, I, got, I acknowledge you got good information, check passed. Or the predetermined limit times it out, one of the two. That's how it works. It works the same on radio as it does on your cell phone. This is the original text message, or it used to be on radio. Now it's on a different kind of radio. Remember, these are radios. It may, may be your lifeblood, you may live and die by this, but it's still a radio. Pactor, another one. Pactor is a combination of two earlier digital modes, packet radio and one called Amtor. Pactor provides improved throughput because it transmits speed adapts to the quality of the link. It takes a longer time to send when the conditions are poor. It sends quicker when conditions are good. It uses compressed characters. It compre takes those characters and just doesn't send them as the characters are, but actually compresses them down. It uses compressed characters, operates over half duplex mode, and uses automatic repeat request, an ARQ protocol. So it uses NAC again, which means didn't acknowledge, send it again. And too many NACs and the signal dropped. So Pactor actually uses a little less bandwidth and it's a lot more efficient. And it adapts itself to the quality of the link in between. There are some issues with Pactor. <coughs> you can determine if a channel, how do you determine if a, if a Pactor channel is in use? Well, you tune your, if you've got a Pactor modem, handle the handle Pactor, you put the modem receiving, the controller in receiving mode in which you receive only and don't, and don't make a connection. And you listen to see if there's anybody there. You cannot join an existing contact. You can't break into an existing contact. It's not possible because Pactor is limited to connection between this computer, or this radio, and that radio, this system and that system. It's two of them talking back and forth, acknowledging or uh, knacking or racking each other, and sending information back and forth. If a third signal tries to come in, it follows up that relationship. All of a sudden, now I got another signal in here that the guy I've been talking to hasn't, it didn't send. So what happens is it, it'll time that, that, that signal out. Once you try to break into a conversation, you corrupt that data path that's going back and forth, so to speak, and both, they, both of them lose their connection. They have to start over again, or start over from wherever you interfered. So it's not, Pactor is not one that you can break into. But it's another, another mode, another digital mode. Um, it's, I think Pactor is one that's proprietary as well, if I recall right. Amateur radio Wi-Fi. Do you know hams have Wi-Fi, their own Wi-Fi? Don't they, Jason? Oh, yeah. Our own version of the dark. Mm -hmm. Hams, uh, th this, hams share channels with the unlicensed Wi-Fi. Unlicensed Wi-Fi operate, uh, on one band they operate on is 2.4 gigahertz. We also can operate on 2.4 gigahertz. Pretty used in some of the same equipment that regular Wi-Fi use, but a different protocol, so to speak. Um, 
actually, we could operate on other ones as well, but for the purpose of your uh, exam, 2.4 gigahertz is the one that's important. It's known by several names. It's known as Mesh Node. It's known as Arden, Amateur Radio Disaster Emergency Network. It's known as HSMM, High Speed Multimedia. It's known as several of those, but it's, it's amateur radio Wi-Fi. However, we can only communicate with other hams. We're, like, we're authorized to use much more power than regular Wi-Fi can use. And we've got link, links set up all around the Metroplex here where we can talk back and forth using voice over internet as well. It, it is voice and, and data both? Yep, yep, whatever you want. We do some magic with our, with our DMR repeater. We port our DMR, our DMR repeater, if I recall right, we port our DMR repeater from our repeater to the internet over um, our high speed internet mode, our amateur radio Wi Fi. Pardon? It's all on the clear where I yeah. guess anybody can monitor it, huh? Yeah. If you've got the, the software, yeah. Yeah, you can monitor it. It's not a problem. A ham radio is always in the clear, it's not encrypted. Yeah, right. You can never encrypt ham radio. <coughs> so it's all, everything's in the clear. But we can't communicate with unlicensed Wi Fi users, and they can't communicate with us. So if you want to put your Wi-Fi receiver up, you load the right software, you can hear it. WinLink. This is one of the things we've been talking about. WinLink essentially is email over ham radio. WinLink is a pretty interesting thing. It's a worldwide radio messaging system. And it uses ham band frequencies. How it, what it's set up is that there are multiple central message servers, servers to handle these signals, to handle these messages all around the world. And a standard network system for amateur radio email. So you can, and it's where it's popular. You can link to the internet, or you can operate independently. You can operate radio to radio, or you can operate radio to internet. You can operate both ways. You can send, a, compose a test message, me text message, and submit it to be sent over ham radio to WinLink. It's popular for emergency communications. For example, when the internet goes down, as an example, the internet would go down, we revert to WinLink. It's also popular for hams that have, or in situations where they don't have access to the internet. Let's say that you're, you got, you got yourself a nice 70 foot yacht, and you're cruising out in the ocean, and you got no, and you don't want to buy a satellite link. And really it's not, a satellite link doesn't work on when a ship's bobbing around. So you want to send an email, send and receive email. You can do that with WinLink. An HF radio and WinLink, you can get a, send messages through WinLink through the worldwide messaging system. It's a pretty neat system. It's kind of complicated initially to, to, to envision, but once you've got it set up, it works pretty well. There's new amateur digital modes being released at a pretty rapid pace. A couple years ago, we wouldn't have thought much about FT8. Now it's one of the most popular modes around. But one of the things about it is that none of this data, as you had talked about this, anybody can listen to it. It's not encrypted. Encrypted for amateur radio, encrypted digital is not permitted under FCC rules except for what? Control of amateur radio satellites. That's where you can use an encrypted signal because the last thing you want in the world is to put up a satellite and have some hacker mess with it. That's the only place it's, that it's used. Other than that, encrypted digital data is not permitted in the F under, for any conditions other than that of the FCC rules. Now, it doesn't mean just because you turn your radio on and listen and you can't figure out what it is, doesn't mean it's encrypted. It just means you don't know how to do it. Before using any new digital data protocol, on the air. Its technical characteristics must be publicly documented. It has to be known. If someone wants to listen to it, it's not a secret, it has to be known. So even though you can't hear it, even though you may not be able to get, don't have the right software on your computer to decode it, doesn't mean it's encrypted. It just means that, but that, that data is published somewhere. And a lot of that data, for most of these digital modes, that data is public domain. For most of these digital modes, that data is free. 
So if you want to operate FT8, PSK31, you know, MS, any of those digital modes, a slow scan TV, you want to operate those digital modes, download free software. Put a sound card interface on your, or a TNC on your radio, and go to town. You can do that now. You, all sorts of opportunities are opening up to you with your general class license. Software defined radio. This is the latest thing, this is really cool. In software defined radio, most of the signal processing functions are now performed by software. Well, they used to, your radio used to be this big to operate on a couple modes, and it used to weigh 45 or 50 pounds because of all the circuitry inside, all the coils, different filters for different bands, different crystals for making single sideband, all sorts of stuff in there. Most of that, in, that processing is now done on a computer. It's now done with, with, with a, a computer system. Now, typically, when you talk about a software-defined radio, you're going to think of one or two environments. One of the environments is going to be a unit here that's the software-defined radio. It looks like a box and it's got cables on it. How do I operate this thing? Well, the way I operate is I plug a laptop in it, or I plug a desktop in it, I plug a computer in it, I load the software that goes with that radio, and it shows me that signal display. It's got controls on the top, the frequency. It allows me to transmit, receive, change from single sideband to CW. It allows me to do, to do digital. It allows me to do all sorts of fantastic things. This is my interface right here. This is the radio right here. Or if you don't want to do that, you can buy one of these. This is also a software-defined radio. The difference being is it doesn't have to, you don't have to plug a computer into it. There's your waterfall display down there that you used to see on the computer. You can show analog uh, audio display on here. It shows your frequency. It's got, a it's got uh, DSP built into it. It's got all sorts of neat stuff without needing a computer to do it. So you've got two ways of doing this for software-defined radios. That's the two major ways that when you look at software-defined radio, that's the two major things that come to mind. It's either the box with the computer or everything in a box, shack in a box, either way. As long as society didn't fall apart, so there, there's, as long as there's somebody on the other end mm -hmm. that's got one of those, you're okay. <laughs> Winlink is a good example. Winlink, you can still send email back and forth. You can still do communicate digital data communications. You can so send. Like the Winlink, you, I mean, like it, that's assuming that all the towers are going and that you're getting it Wi-Fi and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you can transmit without Wi-Fi. You can transmit like Winlink. That's all on ham radio. So Win remember WinLink? WinLink is, is, is ham radio email. Okay. You can use the internet or not. Okay. Same thing with these. Yeah. You can use either way. WinLink's good, like I said, WinLink's good when the Wi-Fi is down, mm -hmm. when you can't get, like I say, Katrina is a good example. Hurricane Katrina wiped out everything. People with WinLink, a radio, and some batteries was passing messages in and out of the area, long distance messages. They were also using standard audio, they were also using CW, but they were using ham radio propagation, because there, there was no, no repeaters left, they were, all, they were using that information, using ham radio to, to go the distance, to, to jump over, to surpass that. And then they would transmit their information to someone who was in an in a area that there was internet, who could take that message down and send it on to maybe whoever they needed, like FEMA or somebody like that. Yeah, this amateur radio, there's a saying that the AWL uses, when all else fails, there's amateur radio. And consistently, they talk about your grandfather's radio. They talk about old, you hear people refer to amateur radio as old school. Nobody's got anything that exceeds this. There's nothing better than this kind of stuff out there. The digital modes we use, nobody's got stuff better than that. The government might have a few things better than that. The government may have some, some um, digital data that they can use, satellite data while they're moving and things like that. But this is, a t this is high tech. We call it old school type stuff, but it's, it really is. People who don't know call it old school. It is high tech. When all else fails, they're still ham radio. 
And that's the primary use of value of amateur radio is still emergency communications when the systems go down. We talked about software-defined radio. Um, had you taken the, the um, general class six months ago, we wouldn't have talked about this. This is something new that we're talking about. It has to do with software-defined radio. It's called I and Q compo uh, components. And this kind of gives you a little bit of insight how software-defined radio works. I and Q components are known as samples of the same signal the same signal that's coming in to be processed, taken 90 degrees out of phase. You take one signal as it occurs, you delay the other signal till it's 90 degrees out of phase, through the 90 degrees through the full cycle, and you take that signal and you call that the Q signal. You take the I signal and the Q signal. You got these two signals that are 90 degrees out of phase. They're called, they're, they're called to be in, uh, or in quadrature. They're 90 degrees out of phase. Once you've got these signals that are 90 degrees out of phase, I can manipulate with my computer the amplitude, the strength of those signals, and when I put them back together, they become a different signal because they no longer look like the original signals. I put them back together and I can make a, a, an AM signal, a voice signal out of it. I can make a single sideband signal out of it. I can make a digital signal. I can make all sorts of stuff out of it. That's what happens. So you take these, all sorts of type, different forms of modulation can be created by taking these two signals that I've manufactured one original one, one I manufacture 90 degrees out of phase, change the amplitudes, put them back together, and create different kinds of modulation by, by varying that, that difference using the formulas and the algorithms in the radio. So I take my Q input, my, my I input, my Q input, my I input, I put them together, and I get a different modulation output. If I change the amplitude of this one, modulation output's different, maybe a different type of output. So this is the 90, the 90 degree shifted signal is called the Q signal. The original signal is called, the initial signal is the I signal. Now, how do you use this? When do you see it? Unless you're a software developer working with software defined radio, you don't. It happens in your radio. You click, put the option that says, I want single sideband, it does all that for you. you the option that says, I want CW, I want FM, push that button, it does all that for you. You, unless you're coding the signal, you'll never see this. So if you're gonna ask me, why did they ask me this question on the test? I don't know. <laughs> but you'll see it, you'll see a couple questions on it. Yeah, you can't, you can't affect it. Unless you break your software, you can't affect it. It's invi gonna be invisible to you. Yeah. This is a SDR scanner though. Yeah. It first one, it, it says true IQ. I, did not know what that meant, to be mm -hmm. honest with you, but for, on the, like the Fort Worth system, it's a, a simulcast. Yeah. And older scanners just, right. it, I mean, it, 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 you could live right in the right spot and get the signal, maybe, if you were lucky, mm -hmm. but otherwise, anywhere else, you know, just would break up one good signal bad. This, that now, fixed it, and it's that, it's that. Now you've seen IQ. Thing, it? you've yeah. seen, it's, a, it's a marketing term, huh? Uh, it makes a good well, marketing term. Was, <laughs> that's how that's how it works. That's the IQ. You, as a user, you'll just use it, but uh, you won't be affecting it anyway. You'll be just using what it does. Review. CW signals and pro sign for brevity. Those are listed in your book. I would kind of be familiar with those. They might ask you one of those. Those would be those are the candidates. QRL, QRN, QRS, QRP. QRV, QSK, QSL, AR, and KN are the candidates that may be a question on your test. This is one of the things you memorize. Remember I talked some stuff you're going to have to memorize? Hopefully the rest of the stuff you'll understand. Radio teletype uses Bodo code, five data bits. Maximum data rates below 10 meters is 300 baud. 10 meters gets to use 1200 baud. Six meters and two meters, 19.6 kilobods, 19.6 thousand bods. 1.25 meters, the 220 band, and 70 centimeters, 56 kilobods. This signal here is about that wide. The signal here is about that wide. Because, just figuratively speaking, because as the speed goes up, this signal width increases. It needs more bandwidth. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
You'll notice the reason it does that is because even though on this chart every band is drawn the same length, they're not all the same length. If you draw this to scale, you're going to find out that some of the HF bands are about that big. Some of the UHF bands you'll draw will be about that big. Up in the VHF and UHF frequencies, we've got a lot of bandwidth. That bandwidth is, more, is worth billions of dollars to commercial applications. And the FCC still lets us use that, lets us have that bandwidth because of the value that the amateur radio service provides during emergencies. <coughs> Software-defined radio. That's one in which most of the signal processing is performed by computer, performed by software. It uses those I and Q signals that are 90 degrees out of phase. And by manipulating the I and Q signals, all sorts of modulation can be created. That I and Q signal in that software-defined radio by adjusting the values one way, you can receive AM. By adjusting the other ways, you can receive FM. By adjusting the other ways, you can receive some digital data. Questions?